Hi everyone, welcome to my channel. Today, we're diving into another tragic case. A psychological exhumation changed the outcome of the investigation four years later. A psychological profile is called a detailed examination and analysis of a person's personality, their character traits, behavioral peculiarities, emotional state, intellect, self-esteem, and the motivations behind their actions. To compile such a profile, experts typically resort to methods such as interviews, various psychological tests, observations, situational modeling, and even analysis of social media pages. But what if the person has long passed away and you need to create their psychological profile and assess their emotional state shortly before death? The case of Kristen Trickle is quite complex and unique in its kind. It is referred to as the first instance of psychological exhumation in forensic history, conducted to uncover the motivations and thought processes of a young woman who suddenly decided to end her life. No one believed that the joyful, devout Kristen, who had big plans for the future, would suddenly end everything without any apparent reason. The forensic pathologist's conclusions supported the main theory, but an experienced psychologist managed to uncover the truth. The main problem was the time that had passed since the tragedy. Years had gone by, but eventually, this did not prevent the conviction of the criminal who was sure he had gotten away with it. Kristen Trickle, nay Trickle, was born on August 14, 1993, in a small town in southeastern Nebraska. Her childhood can hardly be described as carefree and untroubled. Her biological mother left the family when the little girl was not even three years old. The woman abandoned her husband and child for another man, moved to California, and never again showed interest in her daughter's fate. Kristen's father, James, raised his daughter on his own, doing everything possible to ensure she lacked for nothing. However, the man suffered from a severe illness that progressively worsened, and when Kristen turned 16, her father passed away. Since there were no other close relatives, she could have been sent to a shelter until she came of age. At this time, an aunt and uncle on her father's side, who lived in the neighboring state of Kansas, stepped in. Although the couple was raising three children of their own, they expressed a willingness to take in their orphan niece and do everything possible to ensure her a comfortable and happy life. Soon, the young girl moved into her relative's home. In her new family, Kristen never felt like an outsider. On the contrary, her aunt and uncle treated her just as they did their own children, surrounding her with love and care. Kristen herself did well in school, attended art studio classes, helped her family with household tasks, and dreamed of becoming a veterinary doctor because she loved animals dearly. Relatives and friends described her as responsive, kind, friendly, and very sweet. She never despaired, confidently pursued her goals, and energized everyone around her with her optimism. The Rice family was religious, so they regularly attended church on Sundays, where 18-year-old Kristen met a young man named Colby. He was an aspiring musician performing as part of a band that played music during sermons and services. He had also recently turned 18, was quite talented, and dreamed of building a successful music career in the future. The young people quickly formed a friendship, which soon turned into a romantic relationship. Colby was skilled on the guitar and wrote his own songs, which he dedicated to his beloved, capturing her heart. He was open, sociable, cheerful, easily made friends and could easily be the life of any party. After finishing high school, the young man took a serious interest in military affairs and joined the army. By the age of 18, he had signed several contracts and commenced his service in the U.S. Armed Forces. Over the next three years, he managed to build a decent military career. Meanwhile, he stayed in touch with Kristen, with whom he frequently called and corresponded. At the age of 21, Colby unexpectedly entered the reserves, returned home, and proposed to his sweetheart, who happily accepted. The couple married in April 2014. The newlyweds settled in a small town called Hayes in Kansas, where Colby finished college and pursued a music career, albeit not very successfully. He performed at small parties and local events, playing cover versions of well-known hits. The couple had two dogs, which they adored, and many considered their marriage quite happy. However, five years into their marriage, a terrible tragedy occurred. On a grim Halloween eve on October 31, 2019, around 4 in the morning, a distressed call was made to the emergency services dispatch. The caller, a man who identified himself, 
As Colby Trickle reported, his wife Kristen had fired a bullet into her head from a revolver kept in their home. A medical team was promptly dispatched to the scene along with a police patrol car that was nearby at the time. At the front door, they were met by a young man who allowed the officers inside but stayed outside himself. Trickle appeared relatively calm given the severity of the situation. When the officers entered the bedroom, they found a woman lying on the bed in a pool of her own blood. A large revolver lay on her abdomen, and a gunshot wound was evident on her chin. It seemed she had already passed away, but unexpectedly the victim moved her hand, and an officer found a weak pulse and breathing. Following this, Kristen was moved to the adjacent room to properly position her on the floor for resuscitation efforts. Unfortunately, despite all efforts, she had passed away by the time the ambulance arrived, and the medical team could only confirm her death. Sergeant Brandon Hotman went outside and informed Colby that his spouse had passed away. The young man asked repeatedly if the officer was sure about this, and upon receiving confirmation, he began to cry. His behavior and tears seemed insincere, as just minutes before Hotman's arrival, he had been casually talking with other patrollers about video games. At first glance, it appeared that the woman had indeed decided to end her life voluntarily, but upon examining the scene, experienced detectives immediately suspected foul play. It was Halloween Eve, and it seemed the deceased had been actively preparing for the celebration. On her bedroom's vanity lay handmade costume decorations she had prepared, and in the kitchen, themed treats for children were set out in bowls, including lollipop bats, ghost gummy worms, and more. The chosen method of ending her life was very strange and untypical for a woman, as was the scene itself. First, the deceased was found nearly undressed, wearing only her underwear. Women generally want to look beautiful even in death, concerned about how they will be found. Secondly, a gunshot to the head is not a typically feminine method due to concerns about disfiguring themselves. Kristen's face was so badly damaged that she had to be buried in a closed casket. The third and most significant oddity was the weapon itself. The revolver was too large and cumbersome for such a petite and fragile woman. It would have been uncomfortable for her to hold, and she could hardly have twisted her arm to shoot herself in the chin. Moreover, the position of the weapon puzzled the officer as it lay on the woman's stomach pointing sideways. However, the deceased spouse explained that after realizing what had happened, he too had thought about ending his life, held the revolver to his temple, but then abandoned the thought and decided to call emergency services in hopes of saving his beloved. While law enforcement continued their work at the scene, the woman's mobile phone, lying on a nightstand, unexpectedly rang with an alarm. It turned out the deceased had plans for the morning and had set the alarm not to be late, but she seemingly changed her mind during the night and decided to end her life. This looked highly suspicious, and detectives suspected foul play. They were dealing with a masterful staging. The widower, now the main suspect, was due for questioning. Colby willingly agreed to go to the police station to give his statement. He appeared upset but not devastated, behaving calmly and confidently. He explained that on that evening, his wife Kristen returned from her job at Walmart, where she was a manager expecting a promotion to senior manager. They had played video games together, and then Colby went to bed early because he was feeling unwell while Kristen went to the kitchen to finish cleaning and setting out sweets for the holiday. In the middle of the night, Colby was awakened by a sudden loud bang. For a few seconds, he was disoriented, his ears ringing, and he could see nothing in the darkness. Once he turned on the light, he found his wife lying motionless beside him, blood pouring from her head. He tried to revive her, but realizing it was futile, he grabbed the revolver, held it to his own head, but then set it back on her body, called emergency services, and went outside to meet the police. The sequence and nature of his actions raised many questions, for instance, why he placed the weapon on the woman's abdomen instead of throwing it on the floor, the bed, or leaving it on a nightstand. It was also unclear why he waited outside for the police and medics if he thought his wife might still be saved. Typically, in such situations, People attempt to perform life-saving measures or simply press something against the wound to stop the bleeding. The former serviceman did not approach his wife again, explaining that he was in shock while a police officer was trying to provide first aid before the medics arrived. Colby did not come over or inquire about the situation. Instead, 
he casually talked outside with a patrol officer about music and video games. Upon learning that Kristen was no longer alive, he squeezed out a few tears but quickly regained his composure. At the station, Colby was asked the standard question about whether there was any life insurance on the deceased, to which he responded negatively but added that he was entitled to some minor payouts from the armed forces where he had served. Incidentally, Trickle began boasting about his accomplishments, noting that he had served in intelligence and was involved in special operations around the world. His words sounded convincing, though it soon turned out that almost none of what he said was true. When asked why, in his opinion, his wife might have taken such a desperate step, he replied that she had suffered from prolonged depression from an early age, which developed against the backdrop of all the events that happened to her in childhood and adolescence. He mentioned her mother's betrayal, her father's death, and her forced life in her uncle and aunt's home, whom Kristen did not even know before. The widower's words again sounded convincing, and he spoke confidently and calmly. Nonetheless, experienced investigators felt that this man was lying and possibly had premeditated what to say. However, at that moment, they had nothing to charge him with. As there were no concrete pieces of evidence against him, so Mr. Trickle had to be released. Kristen's family's perspective when Kristen's uncle, aunt, and her siblings were informed of the tragedy, they immediately traveled to Hayes, nearly 500 miles from their city, to speak with the police and prepare for the funeral. Unanimously, they vehemently denied the possibility that she could have willingly ended her life, citing her deep religious faith, regular church attendance, and her belief that such an act was a sin. Additionally, according to her family, Kristen was a life-loving optimist with ambitious future plans. Specifically, she wanted to open a shelter for homeless animals and had even scoped out an available property with a large plot of land she intended to lease long-term for this purpose. These statements were soon verified, and detectives confirmed that she had been negotiating to rent the property. Moreover, she was anticipating a promotion at work, a position she was very proud of, was preparing her costume and candies for Halloween and had promised to visit her sister for her birthday in mid-November. Her relatives also insisted that she had never suffered from depression, had no mental disorders or harmful habits. Another crucial point they stressed was that she would never recklessly abandon her beloved dogs. During discussions with the police, the uncle and aunt suggested that Colby might have coldly dealt with his wife, orchestrating it to appear as though she had voluntarily left this world. They described her husband as a cruel and domineering man who tried to control every aspect of her interactions, chose whom she could communicate with, and would fly into a rage if Kristen did not respond to his calls or messages immediately. He also forbade her from talking to her relatives, and she would call them secretly from her husband. Visits were rare, but during her last visit, she confided that she could no longer tolerate such treatment, had talked with her husband about it, and if things did not change, they would have to separate. Following conversations with both the widower and the deceased relatives, detectives believed that the forensic examination would be decisive in the case. The examination revealed only one entry wound from a bullet located on the chin. The shot had been fired while the woman was lying on her back with the gun barrel pressed closely to her head. It was possible that she could have inflicted the wound herself, although it would have been extremely awkward for her to do so. There were no signs of struggle or resistance on Kristen's body. However, upon learning from relatives that Colby was a true tyrant with controlling behavior, the detectives insisted on an additional examination for any signs of bruises, abrasions, scratches, or other injuries in various stages of healing. They hypothesized that if the former serviceman had occasionally been violent towards his wife, there would inevitably be some traces. Yet, the investigation was met with disappointment as no internal or external injuries were found other than the gunshot wound. The investigation continued to scrutinize Colby, examining his personality, and it was revealed that he was a pathological liar. He lied so frequently and convincingly that it seemed he began to believe his own fabrications. It started with the fact that he had never been in any hot spots nor had any involvement with intelligence, despite having convinced everyone during the interrogation that he was telling the truth. The man lied to those around him about having a successful music career and high earnings. In reality, for the past several years, Kristen, who worked tirelessly, had been the main breadwinner for their family. Colby, on the other hand, scraped by with occasional gigs during holidays, 
spending the rest of his time playing video games. Despite his real talent, he lacked persistence, patience, and was hindered by his laziness. Furthermore, the police had a warrant to seize and examine gadgets owned by the couple, and this inspection yielded quite intriguing results. The deceased's phone calendar was packed with scheduled activities ranging from haircuts to meetings with a real estate agent. Meanwhile, Colby's messages revealed that he had been openly flirting with another woman, even exchanging messages while at the police station. On a laptop in the living room, a search history that had been deleted was recovered, showing that shortly before the tragedy, there were queries about the payout amount for a life insurance policy in the event of death. This last aspect particularly interested the authorities. Checks revealed that Colby had lied again. Two insurance policies had been taken out on his wife, with him as the beneficiary in the event of her death. These included military spouse insurance as well as a standard life insurance policy. The amounts involved were far from trivial, contrary to what the man had claimed. He had even calculated exactly what payouts he would be entitled to. Despite numerous inconsistencies in the case, direct allegations from the deceased relatives against Colby and the existence of a clear motive for him, the decision ultimately hinged on the forensic expert's report. The document stated that there were no signs of violence on the body except for a single gunshot wound, suggesting that it was highly likely that the deceased had voluntarily ended her life. The case was closed and archived. By that time, the widower had already received the payouts due to him from a special insurance for U.S. Armed Forces spouses. He received nearly $50,000 and from the life insurance policy over $100,000. On the very day the money was deposited into his account, he ordered a life-sized realistic doll for intimate pleasures from an online store. He also purchased a new gaming console, an electric guitar, and expensive musical equipment and began spending the rest on clothes and entertainment nearly every evening in bars and restaurants. Colby was enjoying life, sparing no expense for himself, and genuinely believed that the story was over. With no evidence against him and thus no potential charges, he lived happily for about two years until a pivotal event occurred. In the summer of 2021, a new district prosecutor was appointed, to whom the detectives handling the trickle case appealed for help. They requested permission to reopen the investigation, asserting they had little doubt that the widower had eliminated his wife, making it appear as though she had voluntarily departed from life. As proof, they presented all the peculiarities and discrepancies, pointed to the restored browser history, and highlighted the suspect's very unusual behavior and his clear motive. After reviewing the case materials, the prosecutor authorized the reopening of the case, and in July 2021, Trickle was finally taken into custody. He was charged with first-degree premeditated homicide and intentional misleading of the investigation. During his arrest, he remained calm and immediately contacted his lawyers, who began working on his defense right away. Colby's defense relied on the forensic pathologist's findings and argued that Kristen had suffered from chronic depression for many years and that her tragic departure was only a matter of time. Meanwhile, his lawyers tried to portray their client as a loving and caring husband, a valorous serviceman, and a devout person. The investigation could have hit a dead end as it relied heavily on the same medical conclusion. Thus, the prosecution took an unprecedented step by bringing in experienced specialists to create a psychological profile of the deceased and analyze her emotional state just before the tragedy. This unusual method was termed a psychological autopsy or psychological exhumation. The psychiatrist conducted extensive work analyzing data from Kristen's mobile phone, her social media posts, her most recent photos, and also by interviewing her relatives, friends, and colleagues. Gathering and analyzing the information took months, but the expert's conclusion was clear. Kristen could not have intended to end her life given her short-term and long-term plans. The legal proceedings in this complex case began only in September 2023, nearly four years after the tragedy. The defendant had a clear motive, behaved suspiciously, and consistently lied during interrogations, but the forensic expert's conclusion initially worked in his favor. However, the prosecution now had another report that could potentially turn the case around. When Colby was questioned about the insurance inquiries on his computer, he claimed they were probably made by his wife, wanting to know the payout amount. However, the date and time of the request completely contradicted his words, as the girl was confirmed to be at work at that time, 
verified by surveillance footage from the store. Asked about the life-size doll for intimate pleasures that he purchased even before his late wife was buried and other expenses, he responded that he couldn't sleep alone and needed someone to hold, and that he bought the console, guitar, etc. as a way to distract himself from grief. His mother corroborated his statements, fiercely defending her son throughout the trial. The psychiatrist's conclusion about the victim's emotional state was pivotal. This meticulous work took time, but its results left no doubt that Kristen had not planned to end her life. Additionally, a curious detail emerged from the autopsy report regarding the bullet's trajectory angle. In the courtroom, the jury was shown the weapon used and the angle at which the bullet entered the girl's chin. Kristen was right-handed, but the nature of the wound suggested that either she shot with her left hand or someone positioned to her left had placed the gun to the head of the sleeping girl and fired. To life imprisonment with the possibility of parole no earlier than 50 years. The defendant never admitted his guilt, and all his appeals were rejected. Most curious and strange in this case, however, is that corrections regarding the cause of death were never made to the medical report. Thanks for watching, guys. Subscribe to my channel. There are many shocking stories ahead of you. On November 20th, 2023, the jury unanimously found Colby guilty on all counts, sentencing him.